Good morning and welcome everyone to, on this somewhat cooler Sunday. <laughs> um, and it is 4th of July, so I hope that you will all stay safe if you're having a special activities for that, if you're going to fireworks or uh, having barbecues outdoors. Um, whatever you will be doing, I pray that that will be a real blessing and lots of fun. I want to welcome you all here to Cuba First Baptist Church. And of course, we welcome our online viewers as well. And we want to go over some things in our bulletin concerning our life of the church. And one of the first things you'll see is an insert about our new COVID guidelines. And of course, these are always subject to change depending on the COVID climate. So I know there's been a lot of news about the Delta variant and all kinds of things. So we are staying vigilant. So far we have not heard of, I have not heard of any cases in our area. And so um, for now that you will notice that the check-in, the screening is not necessary. And we are social distancing according to one's comfort level, meaning that there's social distancing on the south side of our sanctuary, and those who are vaccinated and feel comfortable may sit on the right side of, not the right side, that means there's a wrong side, correct? <laughs> the north side of the sanctuary. And masks and social distancing is required for unvaccinated people and children under 12. That's, that's highly encouraged if uh, children have not been vaccinated. Uh, use of printed hymnals, Bibles, bulletins, etc., is permitted. And just for clarification, we do not need our masks to sing unless you feel more comfortable about wearing your mask. Other announcements, congratulations to Ann Gross, who is the new grandmother of two beautiful twin girls that she welcomed on Monday, June 28th, and the girls' names are Sloan and Evan. So congratulations to you, Ann. We're so glad that you're with us, that we can congratulate you in person. <laughs> Also, Betsy Hubbard is going to be um, having a celebration at Meredith's New Land across from Donna Clayson's home. I hope you all know where that is. Uh, at the lake at 1 p.m., Betsy is celebrating her 90th birthday, and that gathering is on July 18th, and you're all welcome to come and, and greet Betsy with a great big happy birthday. I am going on vacation, that's another celebration, and I leave tomorrow morning for Indiana to spend some time with my son, Brett, and his family, and I should be back um, in Cuba uh, about a week later, but I'll still be on vacation until the 18th. Of course, you may notify me if there are emergencies, and um, we'll figure out what to do about those should those occur. I'm thinking it's gonna be fine. Men's Ministry wants to invite the men of the church for a prayer breakfast on July 18th from 8.30 to 9.30. Stop in and share in a coffee and donut and you'll be talking about some potential service projects with Camp Vic and here at Cuba First Baptist. So please contact Bill Beck, that's the big guy, behind the tech stuff in the back of the church or the front of the church. Um, so please see him. Also, uh, the deadline for Camp JYC sign up is fast approaching. The deadline is July 18th, which is two weeks from today. And the cost per camper is $65. There are scholarships available for families in need. And the retreat is specially designed for kids completing grades two through six. And the camp theme is called Reboot. So there's information about the camp out on the tables in the court. So if you haven't been able to pick one up and you're interested, please do that. And of course, it's getting closer to September. 
and we are planning to have Sunday school classes for all ages. That includes the adult classes that we normally have. Those are also projected to be in session starting in the fall. And that is all of the announcements that I have. I do want to lift up our friend of the week, who is Joni Kotwitz, and her address is in the bulletin. And if you, we haven't seen her for quite a while, and so um, been thinking about her, so please send her a card or a note or a phone call just to let her know that you're thinking of her. Also, I want to let you know that I was able to talk with David Halstead. Uh, he is doing very well, and last I had heard he was not, and they were going to have one last resort in his care, and I was delighted to hear from his sister that David is doing very, very well. In fact, he's driving again. So uh, he's back at his address in Brompton, and so if you still have that address, you can also send him a note letting him know that we're so glad to hear from him and that you send your um, thoughts to him as well. And I think that is all of the announcements for today. And so let us now prepare our hearts for worship. And I'll invite you to stand for our invocation. Please join with me. Freedom giving God, we gather in your name to worship you. We are here to lift our hearts in praise, to open our minds, to hear your scriptures read and proclaimed, to be placed upon a new path for righteous living. We pray that as we come to worship you, that you would free us from whatever it is that is weighing us down, our sin, our sorrow, our shortcomings, and our fears. Amen. And now we're going to sing a new song to, to an old tune called Sing a New Church.
us, let us really think about our relationship with the Lord. seated. Amen. Jesus is our best and our all. And isn't it wonderful that we can come right before his throne of grace and lift up all of our joys, all of our concerns, all of our anxiety, all of our excitement, all of everything. So let us go to the Lord 
in prayer. Before we begin, I want to let you know that Sandy is still in hospice. I have not heard word, and so we want to keep her, Larry, and their families in prayer. Uh, Karen Strand, her wrist is healing well. Continued prayers are appreciative, but, but she is doing very, very well, and so we're thrilled about that. Also, we want to be praying for the many, many hardships that are being experienced all across the nation and in the world. And I'm thinking particularly of the heat wave that has um, struck the Midwest and the West and the drought that is ensuing and so many other things that that, that predicament is causing. We want to be in prayer for all of that. And also um, for the Surfside collapse in Miami. Um, we want to continue to pray for those who have survived, those who have lost loved ones, and also for that whole area that is very, very uncertain about whether high rises, certain high rises can still stand. Uh, there's a hurricane warning and all kinds of things. So our prayers uh, are, are very much needed for that and Oh my goodness, it just feels so heavy, doesn't it? There are conflict spots and all kinds of things that, that are happening all over the world that we want to continue to pray for. And there is power in, the pray, in our prayers. It may not feel like it because we, we don't always have the words to express what we hope for and what we're praying for, but God knows and God is at work and he um, he desires our prayers. Also, let's pray for military, police, firemen, emergency responders, all who care for others, and continued prayer that COVID will be completely eradicated in our time. So let us now go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all of the ways that you are with us, going before us, behind us, around us. Thank you for sheltering us, sustaining us, and blessing us. Lord, we bring to you all of those concerns that have been mentioned already. We pray for those who are waiting in hospice or comfort care. We add Ken Maxson, who is currently in comfort care. We pray for Jillian as um, she keeps watch with her grandfather. We pray your peace and your blessing your strength and your comfort during this time. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. We ask that you would companion with each who are grieving, Lord, that you would bless and sustain, that you would help families to create new meaning in their lives, not that those who they have lost are meaningless, not at all, but that you would help in the moving forward of their days. Lord, we pray for all who are in danger, those who are suffering from extreme heat and drought, those who lack resources, those who are in need of every kind, Lord God, we pray that you would provide. You are Jehovah Jireh, great provider. Lord, we pray for travel mercies for those who will be traveling to and fro this holiday weekend and through the summer. We ask that you would keep them safe 
We pray for those who will be celebrating festivities today and tomorrow with fireworks and travel back and forth. Lord, we ask that you would help those who struggle with relationships, who experience loneliness, those who are anxious, those who are lacking in confidence of how important they are in this life. To friends and families, and especially to you, we ask that you would encourage. And Lord, each of us carries within us burdens that maybe some you alone know about. And so we offer those things up to you, either silently or aloud, knowing that you will answer, Lord. We thank you so much for your care and your grace. We thank you for friendships and family. And Lord, we thank you that you desire relationship with us in such a way that, that you have called us your own, that you reside in our hearts, in our lives, that there's nowhere that we can go to escape you, and that all that you bring into our lives and all that you call us to, oh Lord, you are right there in the midst, helping and blessing. Lord, we pray that you would expand our minds, our, our creativity and our imagination, that we may reach out in your strength and in your spirit to lift others to present possibilities, to express the abundant life that you give to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May be seated. Well, we are not going to have a children's message today, nor is there junior church following our service. And so um, I'm just going to go right on ahead to the scripture. And it is not Romans, it is John chapter 8, reading verses 31 through 38. As always, listen for God's word to you as I read. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are the offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. 
the sun remains forever. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because of my word. It finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. May it truly, truly take root in our hearts and bless us. Well, today is 4th of July, isn't it? And as a kid, I was never one who really liked celebrating the 4th of July. It certainly did not feel, at least to me, like a celebration of freedom, and I'll tell you why. For one thing, freedom for me meant not having to go to school, but since school was already out for the summer, 4th of July felt like anything but freedom. You see, it was a tradition in my family that we would attend our family reunion on my dad's side. And that meant not being able to gallivant with my friends in the neighborhood and having to be on my best behavior for elderly aunts, great aunts, uncles, great uncles, and you know what they always like to do, pinch your cheeks and make you kiss them. <laughs> That wasn't freedom for me at all. And of course, along with that, we had to mind our manners. We had to say please and thank you, and we had to be on our best behavior. Because you know, children were to be seen and not heard. For my siblings and me, Independence Day felt more like the most dependent day of all. When are we going home, we would whine. Well, that depends, my parents would answer, on whether your father and his cousins will play some ball when it cools down and if the adults play cards afterward. And the only fireworks that we would get to see, really, was an occasional argument (laughs) that would erupt around the table. And I admit those could be very entertaining, but hardly freeing. Now, don't get me wrong. Those family gatherings were not miserable. We kids had loads of fun. It's just that we really didn't have the freedom to choose where we would rather be and what we would really like to do. I'm glad to say that I have come to appreciate more and more the freedoms that we enjoy and, as, and the freedoms that we enjoy as a nation, the freedom of speech, the freedom of the press, the right for people to peaceably gather, and the right, the freedom, to petition the government for a redress of grievances, as stated in the Second Amendment of our nation's Constitution. We are a free people. The Constitution says so. But are we really? I have come to wonder more and more about that in all the sharply divided issues of identity, equality, oppression, racism, and violence that our nation is experiencing. I believe we are a free nation, a nation that professes we are one nation under God. Hmm. We have to think more about that, don't we? And so in our scripture today, a group of Jews also make a profession. They profess to believe in Jesus. And this discourse actually begins with verse 12, as Jesus declares to the crowd that he is the light of the world. And the Pharisees answer that testimony They say that that is not true. Jesus is not the light of the world. But as Jesus reveals to them more and more of his true identity, some of the Jews in the crowd 
indicate that they believe that what Jesus has said is true. But that is not enough. Jesus brings them one step further by declaring that they must not only believe his word, but abide in his word, which means they, have, they must live by his word. They must follow him, do what Jesus does, become more and more like him through obedience, sacrifice, and the work of the Holy Spirit. They think they've already arrived, the, this small group of Jews who said they believe Jesus, and that in God's eyes, they believe they are already free because they are the descendants of Abraham. They say they have never been enslaved to anyone. And I confess, I marvel at this. Do they have blinders on? Have they forgotten their history of 400 years of slavery in Egypt under Pharaoh? Are they forgetting the very real bondage that they are under presently by the Roman government? Or are they a people of privilege who cannot discern the spiritual darkness that has ensnared them? Indeed, they are not free. Their real bondage is not held by a world power. It is sin. Jesus tells them in verse 34, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And he knows that they are practicing sin because at that very moment the Jews were wanting to kill him. The words of freedom that Jesus had spoken to them did not take root in their hearts. Jesus says that he speaks of what he has seen with his Father, God, and that they were really speaking about what they have heard from their Father, meaning the devil. B. Milne said it best in his book, the message of John, here is your king. He says, Jesus clarifies the nature of their bondage. It is a bondage to sin, which only Jesus, as the eternal Son of God, is qualified to break. The inadequacy of the response is now clearly disclosed. Their true father is not God, but the devil. They have no room for Jesus' word. They are ready to kill Jesus. They do not love Jesus, although he has come from God. They are unable to hear what Jesus is saying to them, and they refuse to believe in Jesus, although they cannot prove him guilty of wrongdoing. In general, they show the twin characteristics of the devil, lies in that they reject the truth of Jesus, and murder in that they seek the death of Jesus. In all of this, they demonstrate that they do not belong to God. The moment that Adam and Eve chose to listen to that devil of a snake, they lost the freedom that they had enjoyed with God. Sin took up residence in their hearts, and every human's heart afterward. They became slaves to their sinful nature, which only God, through Jesus Christ, could save them. And so we cannot be free from our sinful nature without Jesus. We cannot be freed from sin just believing about Jesus. The author of James tells us that even the demons believe in Jesus, and they tremble. And we all know that demons will not be saved. Our freedom, our salvation, depends on our life in Christ, true discipleship. Jesus does the saving work, and we abide in him through continued repentance and obedience to his will. 
All too often, when I have asked someone what it means to be a Christian, I hear a litany of, I go to church, or they might not say that they go to church, because church people are hypocrites. I'm sure we've all heard that from some of those who we try to invite to church. Or maybe we'll hear that they're Christian because they believe that Jesus was a real person. Or that they are a good person because they do good things for others and try to live a good life. Often, people equate goodness with Jesus, and that's not wrong, but it's not the whole story. That's just the surface. Perhaps these are things that they have heard from their fathers and mothers. I have to wonder what they may have been hearing from God. It is not that they are wrong, as I said before, but it is true that for many people, Christianity has simply become part of the culture. Take Christmas and Easter traditions, for example. These two holidays are infused in our culture, but is the meaning of Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection infused in us, in others? Do we let Jesus' words, his character, his spirit truly live in us? If so, we find real freedom from our sinful nature, even though it rears its ugly head from time to time and we give into it. We repent, though, don't we? Because we, we have Jesus rooted in our lives, and so we are sensitive to the nudges of the Holy Spirit. You know, hey, you need to turn around. You need to, to change. You need to be different. You need to be more like me, says Jesus. And so we do. We repent, we turn around, we get back into our discipleship groove and experience that incredible life-giving freedom again. And then something else happens. We again want others to have this freedom too. We want Jesus to work through us as we extend our love, his love, and care to others. We re realize that our abiding in his word, living in his grace, and freely choosing the daily sacrifices that he calls us to, we become part of a much bigger picture, the reparation of a world in which all people will live freely in God's love. Well, I began this morning's message telling a story about how I understood freedom when I was a kid. At that time, I really didn't know much about what our nation was celebrating, only that I was not a free agent at our 4th of July family reunions. It was all about me, you see. And so I want to tell you a story about the magic of freedom on another not so very long ago 4th of July. On April 8th, 1983, before a live audience and on television, in a dramatic effort to illustrate the tragedy that would ensue should America lose her freedom, David Copperfield, the renowned magician, created the illusion that the Statue of Liberty had disappeared. Any of you remember that? Did anybody watch on television as it happened? Well, then let me tell you about it. It truly did disappear. Well, we know who David Copperfield is, the magicianist, the, the illusionist, but you can go to YouTube and, and find him talking about it and showing a clip. But anyway, following this incredible feat, Young David Copperfield spoke briefly, spontaneously. He declared that he was a son of an immigrant and that his mother pointed with pride to France's gift of the Statue of Liberty. She recalled that the unveiling was October 28, 1886, and that which impressed David Copperfield's mother was not its enormity, 
Did you know that the statue and pedestal is 305 feet, six inches tall, and weighs 225 tons? That's not what impressed his mother. What impressed her was a portion of the poem by Emma Lazarus articulating the basic philosophy of our American democracy, especially these two lines. And I'll bet you know them well. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Hmm. Mr. Copperfield continued that America would remain free so long as people remembered to communicate, to care, and to show compassion. True freedom, he declared, is magic. Well, the freedom we have in Christ is a little like magic. It begins with our childlike belief that Jesus will save us as we believe in him. But if we are to be free indeed, we must grow beyond a simple belief. We must take up our place in the body of Christ, working toward repairing the world and fullness of the coming of God's kingdom. We must work that all may lay hold of the freedom in Christ. In Christ, we are freely forgiven. We are free indeed. Amen. Well, let us now sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of hymn number 600, America the Beautiful.
Remain standing. This is the part I always get mixed up. <laughs> we are always invited every Sunday worship to give whatever we can that God's kingdom may be realized in our midst, that suffering may be lessened, and most of all, that gratitude and joy would grow in each heart as we see what God can do, even with the very little that we are able to offer up. And so let us now sing the doxology, and then we will dedicate the gifts that we have brought. imagine those gifts being processed down the aisle like they used to well they are here and they will be given we will be given even more to give back to God this coming week and so now let us dedicate the gifts past the gifts present and the gifts to come to our Lord God please pray with me Oh, Lord God, you are the sustainer. You give us everything that we need and more. And Lord, with gratitude and with joy, we have held back a portion that you have called us to give back to you, that, that you have invited us into the work that you do here in our midst, in our community, in our nation and in the world. And so, Lord, all of the gifts that we lift up to you, we pray that you would receive them, that you would bless them and multiply them, empower them and send them. Oh, Lord, that the whole world may know that you are God and that you love us and all of the world, for whom you sent your son, Jesus. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. And now you may be seated. As we come to that very special time when we gather together in communion, which means we are a community in faith and we remember what Jesus has done for us and you know Passover was a key part of Israel's deliverance out of slavery in Egypt and into freedom remember that and God created the Jewish Passover celebration because he wanted the nation of Israel to never, ever forget how he delivered them from slavery. Slavery, freedom. The whole purpose of Jesus' death on the cross was to deliver us from the slavery to sin. The Bible teaches that apart from Christ, we are slaves to sin. Romans 6.6, 6, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Although we were slaves to sin, we have been set free from that slavery to sin. And you know what else? We don't have to sin. We can resist it nor do we have to suffer the consequences of sin, meaning death. Jesus has freed us from sin and its eternal consequences. Romans chapter 6, verse 22, but now that you have been set free 
from sin. (laughs) That freedom was accomplished through Jesus' death on the cross. He was the sacrifice for our sin. Just as God did not want the nation of Israel to ever forget what he did for them in Egypt, the Lord doesn't want us to ever forget what he did for us on the cross. He said, do this in remembrance of me. So let us always remember our deliverance from slavery to sin into freedom from sin through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are freely invited to come and share in the Lord's Supper. And we are free to come as we are, sensitive to God's Spirit working in us. And so let us take a time now to to kind of look inside of our hearts. Is there anything that we need to offer up to him in repentance? Is there regret? Is there anxiety? Is there anything that would be hindering your freedom in Christ Jesus? So let's take a moment and pray and ask God to show us those things if they are present. Please pray with me. Oh Lord God, we are so, so grateful that Jesus has taken care of the sin problem in our lives. And yet, Lord, we are so aware that we dwell in the already not yet, that we still give in to temptation, or that we still harbor resentment or other things that grieve your spirit. And so, Lord, we simply ask that you would bring those to memory so that we may acknowledge them and surrender to them to repent and to receive once again your forgiveness that covers all of our sin. Oh, we thank you, dear Lord, that nothing is too hard for you, that you have already forgiven, but that you are with us to help us to turn again and again and again to you. And so we thank you. And so, Lord, we offer up ourselves now in the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Amen. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes ministering to you in Jesus' name. We receive the bread and the cup. Let us pray over the bread. I would invite you to undo, lift up that first, that first layer that will expose the bread Oops. You've probably already done it while I was praying and talking. (laughs) All right. Let us pray over the bread. 
Oh, Lord Jesus, we give you thanks and praise that when we could do nothing about our sin, you came. You came and you offered up your body, taking on all of our sin, that it would be put to death, bringing freedom to us to be your family, the family of God. We thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice of your body, which we remember as we partake of this bread. The Lord's body broken for you. Let us all eat of it in his name. Now let us pray over the cup. O oh Lord, we see in this cup a symbol of the blood that you shed for each one of us. O oh Lord, we thank you that you have covered us wholly and completely. And so, Lord, as we drink of this cup, your blood, we remember. Make us new again. Renew us and strengthen us as we remember you and your shed blood. In the name of Jesus, we share the cup. Thanks be to God. Now let us pray a prayer of commitment together. O oh Lord, it is a mystery how you have worked your goodness and grace in our lives, how you have saved us through that one act of taking all of our sin upon your body and declaring us to be free indeed as we proclaim you as Lord of our lives. And so strengthen us, Lord, to go out from here in your strength, in your goodness, in your grace. Work through us, Lord, and do wonders and mighty things as we walk in obedience to you. And to all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Now our closing hymn is verse 4 of America. Let us stand and sing. And now, people of God, you are free indeed. Go and be God's grace to the world. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.